The storm after the calm. Um, we'll talk about a few things tonight to try and put into perspective the Calm Act and the changes, uh, good changes and bad changes. Uh, I wanted to start with who we are. Um, and I want to do this just to, for some perspective. Um, linear acoustics started 11, almost 11 and a half years ago, before there was any um, thought about controlling audio levels. Uh, it was started because the uh, ATSC committee uh, was already working on digital standards for broadcast. Um, we were already into surround in movies. Digital production was well underway. And um, Tim Carroll, who's the founder of the company, uh, left Dolby, where he was the professional products manager, and decided to design a processor in the digital domain to handle audio for television. Um, we have always had one foot in the high fidelity world and one foot in the realities of broadcast. If we move forward nine years, digital television is on the air. Um, there is a, a COM Act, there's congressional action to force the FCC to start to control audio levels. It's interesting, in fact, that every country that has turned digital on um, has had legislation started, usually within a year. And we'll talk a little bit about that. From our perspective and the perspective of our users, when digital came, the question was, what about your processing? And it turns out that the processing that we did remained exactly the same. A meter and some calibration allowed you to be compliant with the COM Act. And our experience now, 11 years plus down the road, is that you can process for fidelity in the home. And that compliance with the COM Act is actually a byproduct of good audio processing. There is more than one way to do it. We think that we have the, um, I think we have the experience and I think we have the clients to tell us that we're doing this in a very good way. And one of the things that I am asking everybody in the industry to do is to please listen to what you're broadcasting. Um, it would be interesting actually here for the people um, in the room, how many people have surround at home and can listen to surround regularly? So almost half. How many people turn on surround every time the TV goes on? So two in the room. Um, people watch it for sports, for movies. It's, is, it, is it the room or is it the content that drives it? Um, and it's a question. The general estimate from the engineers I talk to is one person in 10 is listening in surround. The rest are listening in stereo. Um, that puts a little extra burden on the broadcasters. That is, to make something which down mixes well and sounds good and still has power and impact uh, in surround. So with that as a background, um, I want to start, since we're talking about the COM Act, with a couple of pieces uh, of the COM Act. The numbers are the paragraph numbers in the Act itself. This is unique to ATSC and the A85. Uh, in the EBU world, which is everywhere except Canada, the United States, Mexico, I think that there's a one Latin American country who's adopted ATSC. The rest of the world uses one of predominantly three other systems, but they all uh, adhere to EBU requirements. This is not in the EBU requirement. This is unique to us. Design to prevent digital television commercial advertisements from being louder than the programs they accompany. That's what this is all about. Um, it's not about necessarily controlling the level of program content of other kinds. Um, ATSC A85, if you don't know the A85 document, it is from the uh, audio committee of the ATSC. It was revised in February. Um, it's not that difficult to read. It's 65 pages long. Um, I'm sorry, the, com the COM Act, the uh, report and order is 65 pages long, 15 pages of content and about 45 pages of explanation. The A85 is all content. It's really a very good um, reference. Uh, compliance with, the, um, with ATS 85 requires BS 1770. That's the International Telecommunications Union. Um, they did research on a perceptual audio meter. It standardizes broadcast standard 1770. It's in its third revision. Uh, and the golden rule, dial norm. And we'll talk about dial norm for just a minute. Uh, in just a minute. Uh, there is just an update from the FCC to Congress. I don't know if you're aware of that. It is within the month. 
um, um, is it Ann, uh, Anna Eshoo was the uh, congresswoman in California who started the Com Act. Um, Congress has asked for, asked for a report from the FCC every uh, quarter on the progress that the industry has made toward uh, complying with the Com Act. Uh, this is showing uh, December through May, uh, 16,000 complaints. And you can see how those are going down. So very, very heavy advertisement of the Com Act. The FCC has a uh, website where you can file a complaint. The results of these almost 16,000 complaints uh, was that the FCC revised their form because the information was not good enough. The FCC is trying to find a pattern of complaints. And the requirement for that is actually uh, the bar is set pretty high. Um, a station has to be um, historically ignoring the Com Act and there was not enough good information for them actually to take action. Um, apparently there have been a few thousand complaints that do meet all the requirements and the FCC has apparently contacted a couple of stations who appear to be in direct violation with the Com Act. There's little information on that. Are those complaints about specific programming material or complaints if you, about <coughs> broadcasting? It's interesting to go to the, to the FCC website, FCC.gov, and actually do a search for COM complaint, and you'll see the uh, form. It's, it's, I wouldn't say it's difficult, but it's not uh, easy. You have to know the channel you are watching. Unbelievably, that's difficult for a lot of people. Uh, you have to know the, ch the show that was on. You have to know the commercial, that is, who the advertiser was. You have to know the time that the commercial occurred. Okay. A little more information, but that's the basic information. For the FCC to determine if there's a pattern, they need to see complaints that seem to match particular periods of time, particular times. The quality of a lot of these is such that you can't figure out when the commercial was, which commercial it was, what program it appeared inside of. The FCC and, is soliciting comments about specific pieces of programs. The, if you're going to make a complaint, you have to fill out everything that the FCC asks for that complaint to be valid. Not, and, not, not that that has no meaning to them. Okay. No meaning at all. Okay. How much of this <clears throat> decrease in numbers is just people don't care anymore? <coughs> well, okay. If you're going to be cynical, you say people are, being, are, are getting tired. Um, if you're not so cynical, you'd say, actually, what this reflects is that it went into effect on December 11th. And so people were all primed to make complaints. Um, by the time we got into uh, February, it's already down by half. I mean, from my perspective and what we were doing with stations, um, the number of people who ordered equipment in November of 2000 was just incredible. Um, it takes a little while to get it on, takes a little while to get it straight. Um, all of the networks that we, we work with all the networks, everybody was making a concerted effort to correct this. Um, even now, there's some stuff that gets by. But that's not by design. I mean, that's an accident, and accidents happen. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the difficulties of getting all the levels straight. Um, but I, I think this, for us, is actually good news. And if we uh, jump down one more uh, and look from June until, well, uh, September, there was one more report due, but the shutdown of the government prevented the latest report from going out. So this is the uh, one that we have. Look at how small these numbers are for another quarter. It's a 53% reduction from quarter one to quarter two after the uh, act went into place. That's, I, I don't think that's simply people tired of complaining. I, I think that that's actually an effective um, uh, effort to reduce uh, the number. And this is, um, so I pulled this out of the letter that was written from the FCC. It's published online. It was written to uh, the Congresswoman. One or more potential trends and patterns are being investigated. Um, that's an incredibly small number given the number of complaints, the number of broadcasters there are, I mean, this is out of 1,700 potential commercial stations, uh, plus all the MVPDs, the, the multiple video, uh, the cable companies. Um, it, this is actually pretty good. It is, a, it is a market decrease. So I think all this is good news. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the maybe not so good news. Um, <clears throat> and to start to talk about that, I want to take a step back to analog. Um, essentially a meter in analog terms for the way we looked at levels in production. And uh, you know, in a little view of 
our production ranges. Uh, analog consoles, audio, eh, somewhere around zero to maybe plus eight, depending on your equipment. You had uh, a top end of 18 or 24 dB, so you had 12, 14 dB of headroom. Better gear, 17, 18 dB of headroom. Um, this was very, very typical. The, uh, the bottom end went way, way down. Good equipment in analog was making easily in the 90s for uh, signal to noise ratio. Effectively and broadcast, um, the noise uh, was very, very low. And I want to lay against that um, <coughs> modulation levels for FM modulation going out. Um, 6 dB, 50 to down to 50% modulation. 12 dB is 25% uh, modulation. When you get down 60 dB, tenth of a percent modulation, that's, that is your broadcast range in analog. And if we look at commercial production <laughs> and how that's done, Obviously, we're, we're pushing, the commercial production is pushed up against the limiter, uh, and the average goes up. And so you do have commercial levels in analog that could be much higher to program. But if we look at what we did with dynamic range, um, analog was defined by its limitations. You can't go over 100, so you put a limiter there. You can't just bang the limiter, so you use a little bit of AGC. And the effect of that was that we tended to keep average modulations between mo not much lower than 25% or much higher than 50%. The rest was headroom. And so this got a little bit smaller. Commercials could be louder than programs, but not an enormous amount louder than programs. It could be noticeable, it could be annoying, but um, it wasn't truly out of hand. Here's a piece of research. Um, Dolby participated in this. Sit someone down in a room, typical living room style, give them a volume control, present them with content. Let them set the volume control, this level here. And then take the volume control away and present them with program content and let them mark off on a, uh, on a chart where they are. Annoying, annoyingly <coughs> loud to annoyingly soft in a living room environment, it's about a 30 dB range. That's the comfort range of your viewers. From Turn it up to turn it down, about 16 dB. Uh, and the comfort zone, actually not a really, really large uh, comfort zone. You have 2.4 dB up, about 5.4 down. 8 dB or 9 dB. 16 dB and people are still happy. 30 dB and you are completely outside of where they want to be. Now let's lay modulation against that. From turn it down, to where people are happy, that's 6 dB. That's your 50% modulation limit. If you look at turn it up to turn it down, you're not much more than that top 50%. Analog broadcast was a great match for what people at home wanted. Um, not only that, analog was a good match for the receiver. What the broadcasters were sending, 50 hertz to 15 kilohertz, at 100% modulation, you had uh, a tenth of a dB, a few tenths of a dB of distortion, your noise was down 60 dB. By the time you get down to 50% modulation, you have a double to an order of magnitude increase. Certainly, at 25% modulation, your distortion is an order of magnitude higher, and your noise floor is much, much higher. So again, holding averages up here, we did extremely well. Um, the televisions were re relatively large boxes, relatively large speakers. You could get 50 hertz out of a TV. You could get 10 kilohertz out of a TV. Why do you say the noise floor would be higher? Because when you do measurements at 25% modulation, you don't have a 60 dB noise floor below 25%. You have closer to a 50 dB noise floor below 25%. So modulation goes down, the noise floor comes up. And so again, it makes complete sense to use a modest amount of processing in order to hold your modulation up where it belongs. I just want to go to a digital view now. We switched to digital and it works a little differently. Maximum digital level, zero dB full scale, and we come down from there. This number, if you're doing SD, the SD spec allows 20-bit uh, audio. It's about 120 dB theoretical noise floor. HD audio allows 24 bits, 144 dB uh, theoretical noise floor. The noise floor is below anything that anybody at home is going to be able to appreciate. Um, you have all the room in the world. And because of that, 
we also have a change in where averages go. Uh, the target of 24, um, there's a lot of transfer from old movies, uh, optical tracks, um, a lot of production that gets done around uh, 31 to <laughs> minus 27, um, a lot of around minus 24, and as we go back up toward analog levels, um, the average is it's a pretty wide range um, in digital. But when people produce commercials, they're still producing commercials the same way. In fact, there's a huge number of digital tools to ensure that if you want less than 6 dB peak to average ratio, you can do it. Now what happens when you pass this through a digital system? You don't need processing. There's no limitation. There's no 100% modulation. There's just bits. So if you don't do processing and you put digital content on the air, what happens? If you have a movie that's recorded around minus 27, and you have an average up here that's around minus 10, 17 dB. 10 dB jump sounds twice as loud. 17 dB jump will knock you off your chair. This is what happened to the congresswoman in California when her uh, surround system got turned on in her house. This is why there is a wave of regulation following every place that moves to digital broadcasting. The United States, now there's the Com Act. Canada went digital. Now there's a, uh, a similar act to the Com Act in Canada. Uh, Mexico, there's control. Brazil, now there's control. Czechoslovakia, control. France, <laughs> control. As countries roll into digital, this issue and the idea that you can just pass things to the consumer makes for a very bad combination of uh, levels. What we want to do is to bring everything down like this. We don't want to use the old style of processing. We don't want to put a cap on it with a limiter and drive everything in the limiter and make everything sound the same because we have this great range of possibilities. We can deliver very high quality material, but we have to do some control and we have to lay that comfort zone across the control. Um, the 1770 spec. So to understand those numbers, and those numbers I'm talking about SPL um, and VU are peak, the way, we are, the way we're used to looking at things. The new standard in broadcast is not a VU meter and not a peak meter. It's a 1770 meter, an, an LKFS. L for loudness, K for K-scale, FS relative to full scale. This is the new meter. It's a perceptual meter. So if we go back to VU, 1939, CBS and the Bell Company come up with a meter that tells you about average levels. Think tube technology, think tube dissipation. It's very important to know the average levels you put into tubes. Transients, what difference does a transient make in a tube? Tubes rounded off, they distort very slowly, they distort gently. In a well-designed circuit, the distortion isn't even that unpleasant. But start putting transistors in audio circuits. You approach the rails and the onset of distortion is very quick. You need a peak meter. It's an electrical meter. Now instead of being average levels, it's peak levels and you're trying to keep the peaks away from your rails. Now invent an analog to digital converter. The onset of distortion is instantaneous. You go past that last bit, it sounds horrible instantly. So now peak meters become full scale meters. It's an electrical meter. It tells you electrically what you're doing and it protects your equipment. It doesn't tell you how loud something sounds. For anybody here who's mixed audio, you know if you try and look at a peak meter and tell how loud something is, it's impossible, it's useless. You mix level with your ear and you look at a peak meter to tell you you're not clipping anything. If you use a VU meter, same thing is true. VU meter, you can tell what your averages are, but not how loud something sounds. So, a couple of years of research, ITU comes up with a perceptual audio meter. It's a complicated meter, uses a lot of DSP. There's, um, there's a weighting scale in this meter. Uh, there's a particular combination of how you do stereo and how you do surround and how the levels are combined. It's a windowing meter. The longer you let the meter run, the more accurate it is. That is, if you're trying to determine how loud something sounds, you have a better idea of how loud it is after 10 seconds than after one second, a much better idea after 30 seconds than after 10 seconds. Um, this meter takes measurements of 400 milliseconds in length. It overlaps those measurements uh, by 75%, and then it adds those up and integrates 
over that time period to give you a one second reading, three second reading, 10 second reading, 30 second reading. Um, what's amazing about this, 95% accuracy in terms of what people think about the movement of the meter. Up or down, 1 dB, 95 out of 100 people will agree that the loudness has changed when this meter changes. It's very different than a VU. With a VU meter, everybody can hear a 1 dB change on an AB. They can't necessarily tell you whether it's louder or softer. They can tell you that it's changed. With this meter, 95 out of 100 people will tell you that the meter is accurate in terms of their perception of change. That's one amazing thing. Second amazing thing is both the EBU and the ATSC agreed on the same meter. In fact, in the entire world, this is now the broadcast standard meter, 1770 meter for perceptual levels. Um, <clears throat> so it's an interesting piece. And the next piece is dial norm. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with this or not. Every bit of audio in an ATSC system is encoded in Dolby uh, encoding. AC3 encoding. Uh, Dolby AC3 encoding allows for mono, picking up one channel of a pair, stereo, stereo plus the LFE, um, three channels, left, center, and right, left, center, and right with an LFE, uh, left, center, right, and surrounds, left, center, and right surrounds with an LFE. Those are all specified by, um, by, um, by uh, the compressor metadata. Uh, you have dynamic range information, which Dolby puts in there, and you have this thing called dial norm. So in a receiver, you receive uh, the video signal, you demux the audio, you go through a Dolby digital decoder, and you get out the dial norm, and you get out other Dolby information. Five bits, 30, 0 to 31, 31 step attenuator. Um, the object behind this, if you encoded Dolby in production, then you could measure the average level of your production, you could put the dial norm in, and when the next person got it, he would say, well, the average level here is minus 31. And so leave the attenu attenuator where it is. If you record at a higher level, like minus 24, and you send minus 24, when it gets to the attenuator, it turns it down 7 dB. So a program recorded at 31 comes out of the TV at the same level as a program recorded at 24. But um, not everybody encodes Dolby. In fact, very few people encode Dolby before broadcast. So the metadata doesn't work there. Metadata gets lost because it's associated with the data but not part of the data. This works in the broadcast chain because the broadcaster puts it in and an ATSC receiver receives it. So the magic here is if you control your level to a certain LKFS level and you put the dial norm in there as the user changes the channel, doesn't make any difference if you go program to program or channel to channel. The average level is measured or the average level is corrected and it comes out of the TV at the correct level. That's what the dial norm piece of this is. So let's look at how control is being done. Good production control, meters, live events. Um, good ingest control, meters or automated or uh, level shifting with a piece of software that does normalization. Don't touch the don't limit it, don't compress it, don't change the dynamic range, just measure the average, put the average at minus 24. In distribution, distribution would be the HBOs, the AMCs, uh, all of the networks who are distributing to their affiliates. Get it right in uh, distribution, maybe with real-time processing. Good control and transmission. The broadcaster is the last guy in line. Okay? The broadcaster does not like it when they hear from their network or they hear directly from a program producer who says this doesn't sound the same. They don't like it when the public calls and says I don't, I don't like the way this sounds. But they especially don't like it when the FCC calls. So virtually all the broadcasters are doing some control here. Um, and of course the result of that is, with all of that being done, too much of a good thing. What's happening now, and you can hear it, is that everybody's touching the audio. The last step in the chain has to, because they have to know there's control. The guys who are distributing it want there to be control, and they don't want their stuff to be touched downstream, so they're also doing it. People are trying it in ingest and trying it, in and, and trying it also in production control. So 
there is an issue, and the issue is too much control. So here's one concept um, that we have. We were awarded three patents this year, uh, and they all involve putting information about audio levels in an AES linear stream. It's not a watermark. It's not put in the audio. It's using some space within the bit stream that is not in the user bits. In other words, it is not stripped when it goes through gear that is not compliant. It actually gets through every piece of the chain. The idea being that if you do file-based correction, you correct the entire thing. You can measure that and you can put in a signature that says end-to-end -end, this product, this piece of work is at this level. If you do real time, you can put data in um, frame over frame that says this has been controlled in real time. And of course, stuff that's not controlled at all uh, has no signature. When it gets to a device that can read the signature, the broadcaster can make a decision. This, this is certified sign as being at the correct level. We're going to pass it or we're going to do just a little bit to it. This is being done real, in real time, so I'll exert a little control in case the real time goes away. Uh, this is unprocessed, and so I'm going to process it. This gives us the ability to get the broadcast, whatever the broadcast is, whether it's over the top or a broadcast over the air or cable, it moves what's delivered to the customer back closer to the people who did the production. Um, good for fidelity and a possible solution for too much processing. Um, we're working with Dolby as the first partner on this. The idea would be to make this available industry-wide so that anybody who offers um, any of these products can use this signature. And by the way, the signature is in every frame, and it has a um, checksum. So if you go in and you change the levels, the level ruins the checksums of the audio words, and anything downstream will instantly know that the signature is not valid. So it can't be played with. <clears throat> um, I want to talk about another aspect of control. And uh, to do it, I want to throw up this slide, which is a uh, measurement. This is a three-second running average of a 30-second spot. It's a, um, it's, a, it's a real commercial. And you can see the average here is just a little higher than uh, minus 20. The green line is the minus 24 target. And you can see with real-time processing that, it, it's, it, that, can be, that 30 second piece can be dropped and it can look relatively the same. Um, that is a piece of a movie. And it occupies about 30 dB more, 35 dB of dynamic range. When we talk about <coughs> the comfort zone, how do you get, and I, and I can tell you uh, what this is. This is all dialogue. Um, and this is all uh, explosions of various pieces. And that is a zombie wreaking havoc right in there. Um, so here is, that, here is that piece reduced in level and the comfort zone in here. Um, and the point I want to uh, make about this is this doesn't look like what you got with analog when you took a limiter uh, and a compressor and you drove the, and you drove the level up. With, with that, all of this starts to come together and you have a peak up here somewhere which is an absolute limit. And that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is that the uh, microdynamics, all of the small changes, especially with the levels dropping, are all preserved. Because your oral cues to where something is um, in place, like a whisper. If someone's whispering, what makes it a whisper is the sound of their voice relative to the background noise. What makes a shout a shout is the volume, not just the emotion, but the volume compared to the things that are with it. If you can preserve microdynamics, you can pre preserve a sense of space, even though you reduce a <coughs> 30 dB swing from high to low down to something which is approaching 15 dB within that uh, within that allowable too loud to too soft uh, range. This is why the old style of processing can't continue or shouldn't continue. This is a much better model for how things are changed. This is also the difficulty with using normalization. 
That is, there's many, many server-based processes that will take audio in, do a measurement across a piece, and, and move the average. So if you take this and you do an average here and pick this up, you now have peaks which above the average, right? If you do this in the middle, 5, 10, 15, 20 dB, if you take this and you simply do a normalization, you're going to have a peak 20 dB higher than your average. Well, you already know that people at home don't like peaks that are 10 dB higher. You're going to take 20 dB. So 10 dB is about a doubling of volume. Um, you go from a half a watt, you go 6 dB up, you're at 1 watt. You go 6 dB up, you're at 2 watts, you're at 4 watts. If you have someone listening at home who's driving 3 or 4 watts from their receiver and you go up 20 dB, there's no way that their TV, maybe not even a home theater system, is going to withstand that 20 dB peak. So um, there are limitations to just blindly doing a normalization and still fitting this in to what people want to hear at home. So the good news is there's a huge number of tools to fix this. The public is becoming happier with what we're doing, measured by the number of complaints. But the quality of audio is not necessarily great everywhere. And it can be heard. So what I would encourage everybody to do is to listen well. I go to stations all the time. It is rare that a station can hear 5.1 anywhere in the station. It's rare, actually, that they can hear audio outside of a rack room. Um, there are fewer and fewer people in master controls. Master control people have 25 things to do, and audio may not be one of the list of 25 things. Um, it is important, we feel, to deliver the best thing that you can to your viewers. Happy viewers are not complaining. So let's go through that. Um, I want to look at some of the technologies that are available. This is a, this is a reduced sort of a block diagram of one of our processors. Um, you have wideband processing. You have multi-band processing that, um, that works in stages. You have a look-ahead limiter. Um, the intelligent application of different kinds of processing can be a tremendous help in getting audio where it belongs. And again, this is a worst case scenario. If all of your content except commercials is good, and your commercials uh, come in 15 dB hot, you have to look at this technology and you have to set this so you can take a commercial that comes in at minus 12, down 12 dB, so that it averages minus 24, and you have 10 seconds to do that in real time. Well, if you do that to a commercial, and then you get explosions in a movie, those explosions are going to be jumped on very, very hard, and you're going to start to lose everything that you fought for uh, to gain in getting a good product to your uh, audience. So it's applications of a lot of technologies as well. That was a really quick view um, of what's happening with the Com Act. Uh, we are not quite a year into it, and a year into it, a 53% reduction in complaints, and I think, um, in some cases, less audio quality certainly than video can deliver. This is the first time that television has a far superior delivery path to radio for audio. There is really nothing that television cannot deliver in a really compelling, high fidelity, enjoyable way. And all the information that we need to get this right for viewers is out there. We, we know what viewers like. Uh, and, I will, and I will tell you that, that working um, within these limitations, um, we are even making the production people <coughs> happy. And I will tell you, there are some people who do sound in both Hollywood and out of New York who have home phone numbers of people in our company <laughs> and who make calls when they hear things in their home theater system that doesn't sound like it sounded in the theater setup. Um, and even at that, we have very, very, very few people uh, complaining to us anymore because it's a good illusion even in their home. Um, another just side light to this, and, and by the way, if you're looking for information, good information about this, um, the Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences has their own audio committee. Um, it was a group of people who are counted among the best producers of movies and music 
in the world, sat on a committee and came up with a set of recommendations on how to produce and surround, in how to set up a surround system, in what levels to use. Um, that stuff is available for free on the web. Um, it's not just an interesting read, but you can actually set systems up this way, and they, it, it's incredible how well it works. Um, another thought, when you're, when you're looking at audio that you get from program producers and audio that you listen to at home, uh, theater mixers mix in terms of SPLs at about 85 dB SPL, and their systems can usually reach about 102. The people at home, when they set that zero, 95 out of 100 people, will, given that program, will put the audio about the same place, about minus 65. Noise in a typical li living room, about minus 45. So everything's dropped down in level. And that means, as far as the Fletcher Munson curves uh, are concerned, the people who mix this, especially for movies who are mixing at 85 dB, the difference between 100 hertz and 1 kilohertz, they only need to make up a couple of dB to make that 100 hertz sound as loud as 1K. When you're listening at 65, you need 10 dB more level at 100 than at 1K for those two sounds to be equal. The use of processing is not strictly about making sure that you're getting the number right for the COM Act. It is very easy to process for a meter reading. It's really simple. You can throw almost any limiter on there and drive level into it, and, and you'll stick pretty close to that number that you want. It's much more difficult to make it sound good and then have the meter reading come out correctly. It's entirely possible, and we would encourage everybody to be listening to what you're doing and strive to get something that sounds great, because you can, and it can be completely compliant with the COM Act as well. read somewhere that these flat screen TVs, the speakers, are not really very good. Right. And so that, that's, one, that's one place where this kind of control um, can be great. Uh, because you can control the low end, yeah. but if you control it well, you can remove it so that it's not distorting. Right, A one inch thick plasma TV with a small bezel has speakers pointed out the back of it, and it's in someone's TV cabinet. <laughs> so, really, you know, it, if you've got a, one of these fancy systems that you know, really does pump out good audio, right. but not every, a lot of people don't use that. I, mean, I don't myself. That's right. And so the magic here is to make it sound good on both. And there's a compromise going on there. There's control of the low end that keeps it tight, but doesn't keep the level so high that you cannot manage it in a small TV. Um, there's controlling, being intelligent about how you control dialogue and how you do processing to always allow the dialogue to stand out. There's a, there's a lot of nuance in here. Um, that's why a lot of these boxes sound different, because people choose different ways of looking at the world. Um, but yes, that's one of the issues that makes processing really a necessity, is that if you just load full level low end into a thin panel TV, um, you're, gonna, you're are actually going to lower intelligibility because you're going to raise distortion. And it's just a fact. People put TVs in cabinets. It makes them turn them up louder to get the sound out of the cabinet. So you're actually working closer to the headroom with a small amplifier in the TV. So you don't even have as much room there as you really should. Um, it's not unusual to get relatively good sound with a half a watt or one watt. But when you put it in a cabinet and you face the speakers backwards and you've got to turn it up to get the sound to come back out around the screen, you're going to be above that one watt or two watts on a 5-watt or a 10-watt amplifier. Um, you know, 6 dB, double the power. So you go 12 3, dB up, it's 4. 3 dB for power, 6 for voltage. Well, I, voltage in, you have to do the square to power. You're going to have to go up 6 dB in voltage to get the 3 dB rise in power. So 10 dB up to 10 dB SPL, you're going to go 10 times up. That's pretty, that's pretty hefty. Yeah, it, yeah, well, that's why it's expensive to do sound when you have a, a hundred thousand people because you know the multipliers get huge. Yeah, that's, speaking about the speakers in the back, that's why sound the sound bars are starting to become popular. Right. Because now you're actually shooting it out the front and it's got a certain amount of processing in it. Now whether or not you can create 
5.1. That's right. But at, le but at least when you use the sound bar, you're actually getting all five channels. Yeah. And if you put a sub in, you get the LFE. If there's some bass management, which is the other thing about, um, I, I, I don't, I mean, I can talk about what we do. We offer bass management full time. You can give us a surround signal and we'll still do bass management on it. Um, so that the LFE channel gets everything below 80 hertz. So, um, and, and it's something that's used by a lot of our clients. So you're saving the person on a small TV because nothing below 80 is coming out of those small speakers. If you put a sub on it, you're getting not only the LFE, the effects channel, but you're actually getting everything that, that's below 80 from all uh, five of the other channels. So it's a huge benefit because it keeps the television clean, but it gives you huge impact if you have a sub. Second part. Technically, with the dial normal, if everybody was using it correctly, you should be able to go from channel to channel to channel. That's right. Channel. And yet, even in the city of Philadelphia, there's one particular station that their primary is six, nine dB hotter. Yep. Yet, though, you go to the secondary, and it's down the tubes, and it gets to be real annoying. Yes, and there's, you know, it's, it becomes a, yep, nobody, I mean, if you go to the FM dial, there are people who are overmodulating, constantly. I mean, it's just the way it is. You, you know, if you're going to, if you choose to do that and choose to take whatever consequences, if there are, are any, you know, you don't have to play by the rules. The, the point of the rules is it does make it easy for people. And by and large, I mean, my observation in Philadelphia from a year ago is, wow, oh, it's so much better. It's so much better. It is so much better. Um, before the Com Act, there were people here whose dial norm was set at minus 31, whose average levels were close to minus 22. And so that's a tremendous gain compared to the person who actually had it set at 24 and was doing 24. I mean, there were, there were stations here who were just categorically louder. Um, there were also stations in Philadelphia that were pumping huge amounts of air conditioning noise. Um, you could hear the flat on one particular wheel of one camera. You know, in the studio, when the camera rolled, you could hear that wheel. It's like, oh, that's camera two. Um, because I have a sub and they didn't. You know, they just had no idea. Um, Sony, la Sony Labs, um, almost any good analog or digital console now, moving 40 hertz or 30 hertz from the microphone through this system is nothing. Um, we've, we've added an octave and a half to what we did compared to uh, analog, most of it at the low end. And it's easy to get that low end out, and you can, and you can really hear it. Sometimes it's cool during a football game because you can feel the stadium breathe because there's a huge amount of low end there. It's not so much fun in a newsroom, but people are getting better at hearing it. Um, I certainly have a lot of clients in TV who call their friends in radio who are the ones with the surround systems. So when they're tuning a system, they say, well, wait a minute, I want to call my friend. And, you know, they have someone who's in radio who listens for them, who gives them their reports back. And so that's, that's how the circle is made. Um, audio is so cheap compared to video uh, equipment. You know, good, mo good monitoring, a good meter, um, compared to what you're doing for, uh, uh, for digital rasterizers and things, it's really a shame not to put something behind the audio. Um, and set up a listening environment, because it sounds great. I mean, you can also get caught up in the fact that when someone's doing a good job in production, uh, I know CSI Miami regularly has stuff in the surrounds that's down 50 dB. I mean, it's just amazing if you're listening on a good system and you hear people walking up behind you. Uh, it's pretty, people take a lot of care. Some do. Well, there's huge, I mean, everything that I point, the A85 document, uh, is available on the ATSC site. It's uh, the, the newest revision is February. Uh, the FCC, the R&O, uh, is on the FCC website, and you can certainly get that. Uh, the letters that were published from the FCC to Congress are available on the FCC website. Um, the uh, Academy of uh, Academy of um, Arts and Sciences. If you just do, if you just do a search for surround sound calibration on Google, I think one of the hits you get is that Academy uh, article. Two questions. So many televisions now these days and set-top boxes are coming with their own leveling, audio leveling setting in them. Yep. How is that affecting the perceived audio 
in the living room? Um, or should we all be turning it off and tell the manufacturers to stop it? This, you know, it's um, uh, it, the great thing about audio is that it's so subjective. Um, it depends on the box and the implementation. Um, if, you, if you listen in a bedroom, um, it's great at squeezing it all together. I mean, if you're, not, if you're just listening to hear you know, Jay Leno's jokes, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you're listening not for the pleasure of the audio, for the environment, I think that some of them do a tremendous job of helping out with that. Um, if you're listening to a football game or a baseball game, you know, if, if, you're, if you're into sports, some of the sports that are being done now, in CBS, uh, for one, regularly does a fabulous job. Some of the Fox things um, I particularly like because they do full spreads. If you have five sportscasters in front of you, left to right, they actually are spread across left, center, and right. Um, other people are more pure and put all the vocals straight down the center. So the screen's this wide with people sitting here and all the vocals are in the middle. You know, it, that's a taste thing. You know, how do you like to watch? Um, my own family was my measurement. I mean, I, my wife grew up with a, with a uh, GE clock radio, and that was her source of music um, until uh, we got married. And now, if the TV goes on and somehow the surround doesn't go on with it, I mean, I have one of those remote controls that you turn it on and everything goes on. I mean, you cannot turn on the TV without surround. If it does go on without the surround, she will call me wherever I am because something's broken. She knows what it sounds like now and can't, you can't call it, it's out of the telephone. I mean, it, she just can't stand it. She's got to hear everything. So part of this is people getting used to it. Um, and you know what? I mean, I don't like earbuds, but the fact is that a lot of people are used to a real stereo sound. And when it comes to TV and the sound is small and there's no low end at all and there's no high end and it's really squashed, um, I, I think people are starting to not like it, you know, and the measure for that is everybody comes to my house to watch TV. Um, every, every place where I've, where I've helped someone set up a home theater system, that place becomes the place that everybody goes to watch a movie. Because given the choice, people recognize the difference. Has radio gotten away with, with without just because they tend to compress the hell out of the stuff? In, a, in America, there is no Com Act for radio. In the well, we don't have complaints, do we, about commercials being too loud on the radio because it's all the Well, the, there's no such thing as loud commercials. Everything is equally loud. All the time. All. It's, all, it's all the same volume all the time. The goal, the goal there is to keep the average at 50% and have a 6 dB peak to average ratio. Uh, if you have a modulation monitor, you can see that you know, everywhere, except the talk stations, where it goes between 100% and zero, depending on whether someone's talking or not. Um, I mean, you know, that's obviously an exaggeration, but radio doesn't have the same problem. In some countries, they're taking the equivalent of this, which is used by the European Broadcast Union, and the European Broadcast Union holds those rules for radio and TV. So here the Com Act applies to television. Um, if you read the EBU documentation, very, very similar, points to the same, um, points to the same standard for measurement. Radio has got to abide by the same measurement. They're trying to take the level of radio down. I think to some extent, it's a little, um, it lacks some, some technical understanding of what's going on. It makes no sense at all to take an analog signal and make everybody push levels down 24 dB. It's, uh, it's, that's of no benefit in an analog. It does, it's not a, pra that's not a practical, in my opinion, no one's asking me. In my opinion, that's not a practical solution. And that, I mean, that's why I like to go through that difference between our movement into digital um, brings with it huge opportunities for quality, but you can see what happened and why there are complaints. You go digital, well, you know, audio goes straight through. There's no, just no limiter. But, you know, look what happens when commercials are produced loud. So, as I said, Canada, there's a law. United States, there's a law. Mexico, there's a law. Brazil, there's a law one or two other countries in, in Latin America who I don't remember. Uh, I think in England, I know in France, I know in Czechoslovakia, wherever, wherever the move to digital television has been a, it's all flipped. You know, there's not analog available anymore. And it's, it's taken a long time. A lot of the cable companies are still doing analog in places. But in the places where it's all going to digital, that wave of regulation comes right over the horizon as soon as that percentage goes up because 
there's this idea that oh, it's digital, we can just pass it. But you have, none, you have none of the controls that were basically part of the design of an analog system. Hey, you've been, oh. we, we do a lot of transcoding for our customers, and there's audio normalization, which is like an ITU spec, and then there's a brand new COM compliant audio normalization. You mentioned that in normalization, you're just going to take the average and push it up to the center, and then your, your peak audio are going to correct. In, in the COM algorithm, are they going to do something different? Um. There is no, I mean, a comm algorithm is going to be somebody's marketing, you know, for what they're, for what they're selling. Um, their comm compliance is, I mean, comm compliance is complicated um, in terms of what the actual measurement is. Um, there's a definition for the measurement. And the definition is an integrated LKFS measurement across the duration of the content. Now, content is defined as an element. A 10-second promo or a 10-second commercial is an element. A uh, 30-second is a 30-second element. So any short-form content, any piece of content under 30 seconds, you have to integrate across the entire duration of the content, and that needs to be plus or minus, well, I'll, I'll say 20, plus or minus your dial norm setting. So plus or minus 24 if everybody's going to use 24 as that standard. Um, so there is no peak. The peak measurement is part of the definition. So it's not where the peaks are. It's this is the average and the definition of average. Now, depending on the piece, you can have quite high peaks and still be within, be calm, be within the comm spec. And so there's two issues. One, a piece of uh, audio with very high peak to average ratios that was recorded at a low level so that when you raise it, to the correct average, that your peaks are actually approaching the maximum the digital system can handle. I, I haven't seen that, because you have 24 dB of headroom. Um, we're talking, it's jet engines. Um, you, you don't get, 17 dB is, uh, peaks over average is really huge, huge. Um, it's rare that you get that. Maybe the cannon shot in the 1812 overture would make a peak over the average of the orchestra that would exceed 17 dB. But we have working with 24, so that shouldn't be an average. The, the, the consideration is really what it sounds like at home, because you can move the average up and you can have a peak that is way beyond the home viewer's comfort zone. So the question is, how do you, how do you want to handle what you're doing for the viewer? You can be legal in two different ways, but not sound good at home. One way is disregard the peaks, just scale to the average, and let the peaks in the low parts go wherever they go, whether that's correct or not. And then the other way to do it is just put a limiter on it, jam it up against the limiter, so you'll hear everything at the same level. I mean, so it, just, it just starts to sound like radio. I mean, it just starts to sound where everything is the same. I'm, so, I'm really sorry, and I do a lot of work in radio. And stay out of Jeopardy, but it's, it's not going to sound great. Well, right. And what I'm, suggesting, what I'm suggesting is, and that may be extreme. I mean, that movie, it wasn't an extreme movie, but you, you, need, you need to use some judgment. Everybody has to find their comfort level. Um, there's a lot of companies who compete with us in this, you know, in this space. What I'm encouraging everybody to do is to have the facility to listen. You know, you, you may listen and not necessarily pick what, the way that we do it. But I'd be much happier having you listen and go, I like this better. And it's like, well, that's you know, a completely valid thing, as opposed to I have no idea what it sounds like. I just know the meter is right. And the reason I asked that question is lots of broadcasters here who do one or three or five channels and get to correct for what comes in off the satellite. Now, in the case of MSOs that might be doing 500 channels or 700 channels, right. and then they do zones with their ads. So you might have Comcast right. doing oh, yeah. 30 different zones on a single feed, and then you're doing targeted ads. My, my, happy, my, my happiest day was when all the stations in Philadelphia who all deliver separate ads for Comcast called and said, I think we need another box to cover the Comcast ads. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, you know, our, that's one of the solutions. Um, we have a partner. The, what we do here um, is, is actualized as basically um, software processes that run on DSP. But um, 
one of the ways that we can run that is use is using uh, you know cycles in a, uh, in a in a computer, basically on a on a general purpose processor. So we have a partner who's taken our algorithm and implemented it in a file-based solution where you can actually choose the same, we have the same profiles that we do in our box. So our hardware box, uh, well it's, um, <coughs> it's half the real time, it takes half of the real time duration of the piece. Okay. Um, it's for, it's for file-based correction, right. And so, I mean, the first choice in that is normalization, where you set the average level, your target, which would be 24. But then on top of the normalization, you can actually call up a profile. So the same profiles that we have in our boxes. To give you a start, I mean, our, our, our latest generation of boxes have 204 controls over processing. And so that's a lot of control. And so what we do is give you a dozen presets that are targeted to different sorts of uh, of content. The graphic equalizer has the motor in it. Yeah, and so basically you can pick a preset or you, know, or you can listen to them and say, well, you know, I, li I, like what, I like the way this sounds, this is handling material well, but I need to do X, Y, or Z, and then we can help you walk that in. Well, in a file-based process, if you're using one of those profiles, you could say, well, I want to normalize the 24, but I want to put this profile on it. So everything that's file-based is done. Um, in in non uh, in non real time, and then with the processor, I mean, there's various techniques here. Um, now, because we don't have that implementation everywhere of the signed content, we have GPIs, so you can change the presets on the fly. When does different this content. Push back? I mean, the, the, the people who are spending money developing the ads are the advertisers, and so and if, <laughs> if the broadcasters are crushing all of that great art that's going into those. <coughs> Ads. Well, you Don't would. They eventually learn to set dial norm properly. And one of the one of the networks that we work with a lot decided to post on the web requirements for submission of content, and they and what they said, which I thought was brilliant, is we have a contract with our advertisers. When you pay us and we accept your content, we are accepting the responsibility to present it as you have given it to us. There are federal regulations regulating audio levels. We will not change your content. If you give us content that does not meet these specifications, we're not taking it. Now, the corporation had the power because from the upper levels, they just said, we're not taking the ads. And so the network and the O&Os don't take the ads. You don't give them stuff that applies, they won't take it. Now, they were the first ones to do it, and it was, as I understand it, there were a lot of tears, <laughs> a lot of tears over that. But what I'm, what I'm told now is they have about 90% um, delivery according to their spec. Because, you know, I mean, the meters are a little expensive, but um, if, you're, if you're producing on a PC, on a desktop, if you're producing in, uh, you know, Avid or any of those others, there are meters, which are plugins, where you can see the LKFS values. If you read the A85 document, it goes into great length explaining how to produce content that's compliant uh, with this. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it can work, and yes, you would think that people would start to get the idea. So, um, just to confirm on understanding this, it sounds like you're saying that for the 1770 algorithm, there really isn't one algorithm. You know, there could be different implementations, and they may not be exactly the same, so there would be a consequence to reprocessing, like if you decoded, and then recoded through a chain, would there be a consequence to that? Well, yes. I, I, okay. Um, no, yes, and yes. Um, no, there is only one implementation of 1770. There's only one way to measure. So when you do that measurement and you get a level and you have a target and those two things are different, what's different is what you do about that. So assuming everybody uses a good 1770 algorithm and everybody measures the piece and everybody comes up and goes, that piece measures minus 19. The target's minus 24. And so now, just do a gain change. Just take the whole audio track, scale it down um, by 5 dB, and we're done. Um, and that's what 99% of the pieces out there do. They make no other judgment. There's the measurement, here we go, done, finished. Um, and that may even work a huge percentage of the time. If you're, not, if you're not doing movies or doing wide dynamic range content, that's probably great. Um, what clearly happens when you have wide dynamic range content 
and you move all that stuff up is that you're doing nothing at all to control what that sounds like in the living room. And so it's completely legal, but is the viewer a happy viewer? Given what we know about how most viewers think about it, is that, is that the right way to do it? So I'm only saying, you know, think about what you're doing and listen, and don't, if someone says this doesn't sound right, you can just step back and go, ah, it's legal. In fact, that's probably an okay answer for the FCC. I mean, if you can take whatever that piece of content is and say, well, they're complaining about this, but here's the measurements, it's fine. Well, okay. Um, but I, I think the object is, if viewers are happy, and you're happy with the quality of your content. So, I mean, I'm gonna make the assumption we really want it to sound good. So if it sounds good and your viewers are happy, there are no complaints. So in that case, it really doesn't, none of this makes any difference. If, if some amount of control is exerted, there may not be any need for, um, when I'm in Europe and I'm talking to a group of people, I say, if you do it now, there may never be regulation. You may be regulation free. You know, fix it at the beginning and don't, and don't have this flood. I mean, look at what you're about to deliver to your customers and fix it before you ever do that. And it can still sound good. But, so, you know, so let's say a, um, you know, uh, adver advertiser created an ad, you know, they're really happy with the way, um, you know, all the settings work out. Now they deliver that file to a broadcaster, a cable company, they play that file in a playback system that happened to decode it. So now, you know, it goes back to baseband and they had their own, um, you know, call yeah. process. This, but, you know, right. In, in the chain, is it possible that that advertiser unhappy saying, I don't like the way it wound up sounding. Yep. That was different than the way I Absol Absolutely. Every day, every day, many, many times, all over the place, advertisers are complaining. And, and the retreat is, I'm really sorry, but we're under a federal regulation. You're giving us content that's not correct, and we have to correct it. Well, right. If you do, might they not if you, with yeah, it's po yes, it's right. possible, and that's. I, I mean, I'm not making you know this thing. Um, I'm not making up. You know, when it's when it's correct in the production control, and you ingest it straight, and then um, you do the distribution, and you don't touch it. When it gets to the last, if there's someone past you, who the broadcaster, the broadcaster may have that box. And they're just like, I don't, I am not getting the phone call. I know this will control everything. So, you know, is, is that a huge hit? Uh, my experience is it's not a huge hit. At least not, at least not with us because of the way that we process. But if you use us four times, that's going to be a hit. If you use anybody. Let's say a home box office or high end content. You need a broadcaster. Um, telling a distributor, cable company, don't touch my audio. I'll buy license because you know what my my brand is that I have better audio than the other guys and, and so you will not I, touch my audio. You're going to pass it through your train untouched all the way to the TV. A huge number of those suppliers are using us, and the cable companies are measuring them. If the cable company thinks it's not right, the cable company calls them and says it's not right. So uh, the the cable companies. There have been a series of meetings, the ATSC, um, about loudness over the last year. And uh, there have been representatives from all the big guys there. Um, one of them had knee pads and got down in front of everybody and said, please deliver content correctly. I cannot fix 10,000 channels. It, it, the cable companies want the stuff to be delivered correctly. Does not repross. They they have, they said, hundreds and hundreds of reencoders. So they're squashing the video, taking it from 18 meg to 11, but they won't touch the audio. The audio is being passed through. And are they? Do they call you and say it's not right, or are you making it right? If you have no complaints, you're probably good. Well, we have a broadcast server that's working in concert with that, and we have to in our server has to have content that matches what the programmer want. Well, yes, says, okay, yeah. So they're, they're, what you said was they're telling us that content has to be of, of the same quality as... as right. The yeah, and it's difficult. And, and what you always have to remember is um, the slow, sad fade out, you know, over a minute of music in tears that gets hit with the car commercial after it, they're both legal 
and it's not going to prevent someone from going, whoa, I hate that. But that's where the pattern comes in. Um, you know, if that happens, you would imagine, until the FCC pulls the trigger on somebody and that's written about ad nauseum, we're never really going to know. No. No. I mean, according to that last letter, there were only two people. I mean, according to the letter that was written to Congress from the FCC, they were only looking at two cases. What can the fines be? I don't, has anybody, I, I don't think that's, uh, I, I don't think a number was uh, in the uh, report and order. I don't think. Does anybody know? Does anybody know if there was a number in the report and order? I don't know. I mean, typically they start at $10,000 a month. Right. Per, per, per incident? Per incident, yeah. Well, the solution that you're, uh, I guess, talking about, is it mostly hardware-based, software-based, or a combination of both? Well, the reason I ask that is because a lot of times when you have all this encoding and processing and decoding, wind up with sync issues and how I mean that's that's a huge thing especially when you know every step of this chain can introduce a little bit of a, of a sync that winds up you're talking like a lip like a lip sync issue where the latency is yeah they could, yeah um, it, yes it's software and yes it's hardware and depends on how where you place it in the chain and what you know and, and what you do and who you are um, so for a lot of broadcasters, they own uh, an MPEG encoder, which they spent a huge amount of money for, and that MPEG coder has video delay in it, specifically to compensate for um, Adobe encoding outside it. So they don't want to pay for that capability twice. So we have a lot of processors that don't have lip sync capability in it because people just want the least expensive box to do this one job, and they take care of it upstream. All of our latest generation, which counts three devices for now have built-in video delay to the microsecond um, so that you can line up um, the Dolby encoding which takes the longest time and line that up and actually move everything including the non Dolby encoded audio and put everything in line so that when you distribute the SDI you can pick off an LPCM a linear channel and it'll be in sync with picture you can pick off the Dolby it'll be in sync with picture you can pick off SAP It'll be in sync with picture. You can do automatic replacement of SAP with a down mix. So if SAP isn't there, you always have something on. It's all, it, all lines, it all lines up. Um, in fact, a lot of people now are using that to compensate for their entire chain because you have an encoder that does some graphics and that puts in a couple of, you know, there's, it's not unusual for us to get something that's four or five milliseconds off and then we add our couple of milliseconds and all of a sudden your box has got delay. It's like, no, actually, now you're seeing all the accumulated delay of your chain and, you know, go to this box here and adjust it. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't say all. Um, there are other people who do this, which also, I mean, they just include the, the, the um, video delay in it. Uh, thank you. I, 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 during our questions, that's great. But thank you so much. You've been just a great, great audience. I appreciate it. <laughs>